Yes, good evening to everybody and welcome to this Athena lecture. As you know, my name is Jennifer Dine. I'm the head, the director of the ETH Vaughan Forum, the ETH Center for Research on Architecture, Society and the Built Environment. We are a research institute here at the Department of Architecture doing research particularly on the interface between society and architecture, so the social, economic, cultural, demographic and gender dimensions of housing are very much at the center of our research and educational projects. I'm particularly happy to welcome this evening to this uh, uh, event, which we have organized in collaboration with the Parity and Diversity Group, and I'm particularly happy to receive and to welcome um, Anna Pujaner. Uh, Anna Pujaner is a professor that has recently been uh, awarded the chair, the chair of architecture and care here at the Department of Architecture. So it's really an opportunity to welcome her at ETH Zurich at the Department of Architecture. Welcome, Anna. And maybe, as you all know, we invite in the, to these Athena lectures in particularly renowned female, female scholars from the field of urban studies, architecture, urban design, planning, and landscape architecture. And in that sense, Anna really fits perfectly in, this, uh, in, this, uh, in our list of guests where we are bringing the brightest critical minds, the most engaging speakers, and inspiring personalities, very much with the aim of uh, encouraging critical thinking and initiate conversations here at the Department of Architecture. Anna combines historical research, editorial practices, and fieldwork throughout the world where she explores new ways of living communally and inclusive in a comprehensive way. As a co-founder of Mayo, an architectural office based in Barcelona, she also works as a, on new models of collective housing. Furthermore, in 2016, Mayo's participation at the Biennale in Venezia in, Venezia in 2016 was awarded the Golden Lion. Her PhD research focused on kitchenless cities, where she questions individualized ways and types of domesticity and proposes models of domestic collectivity. Anna has previously been an associate professor at Columbia University in New York and has also taught at the Royal College of Art in London and at the Barcelona School of Architecture. In 2016, she received the award of GSD Wills Wright Prize and was nominated finalist at the Rolex Mentor and Protégé initia Initiative. Her research has been published in different forms, including the books The Quantified House and Together, and The New Architecture of Collective. I don't want to take any more time because we would like to keep this event to, to this evening. We would like to finish a by eight approximately, so that we have enough time then to continue uh, this meeting and these informal discussions with an apero. Welcome, Anna. Many thanks for having accepted our invitation to our annual Athena lecture. Thank you very much, um, Jennifer, for the introduction. Um, and I'm very honored to be part of this institution. And thank you for your nice welcome. And the uh, experience has been amazing so far. I'm very honored to be this year Athena lecture and very honored to be part of the initiative um, launched by the Parity Group uh, that uh, fills these two days of activities and events. And I'm going to try to keep it short. Um, so my apologies if I speak fast. First, my English is not super great. Then Spanish people will speak very fast. So the combination of both can be like a bit dramatic. But let me start with a little bit of a statement to frame the work that I'm going to introduce. In these last decades, uh, we have seen how digital technologies are transforming our lives and our built environment. And probably one of the best uh, description of this momentum was uh, done by Paul Preciado in an article published in El País and later on in El Ar Forum, in which he quote, and I'm quoting him now, Paul, today we are moving from a written society to a civil society, from an organic society to a digital society from an industrial economy to an immaterial economy. And due to this, we are aware that the limits of our houses are, are changing, but also their nature. 
we know, for instance, that, and I'm not explaining anything new to you, just refreshing your minds, that online platforms, for instance, allow us uh, not only to work from home, but also to market um, our houses on easily, our possessions, and to use basically all kind of services online. And this kind of um, practices have um, unfortunately um, uh, promoted and expanded existing extractivist practices, and we know that because capitalism is a specialist on, on that. But on the other hand, we have also the opportunity to think about new asymmetries and new forms of conciliation. But what I'm saying is nothing new at all. This, uh, every time that we have an industrial revolution, an industrial change, a change in technology and technological use, we do have an impact on labor and consequently an impact on care labor. And that's what I'm working uh, in this institution. And we can see that very clearly when we look backwards to, for instance, the second industrial revolution in which women entered massively into uh, industrial labor, into weight labor. And we can see then consequences of, for instance, the implementation of certain foods into the house. And I'm, uh, quoting, I'm referring here to electricity in particular, but uh, also other uh, techniques that use the idea of uh, modernity, or it was modernity to, to, that used these techniques in order to... Um, generate this imaginary around a type of work, the care work that suddenly was done by, uh, you know, in a magical manner, effortless, became effortless, and everything thanks to the idea of standardization and um, adequate modern design, right? Efficiency, among other terms, were widely used. But we can also see how the impact of the third industrial revolution also impacted largely in, our, in how our built environment is designed, especially in how the home is designed or the idea of the home. And obviously I'm raising these arguments from a Western perspective, so I wanna make clear. I'm from Barcelona and I'm here in Zurich. And obviously it's a story that is also well known how the new, this third uh, industrial revolution defined by uh, techniques as communication techniques as the TV and other media uh, technologies uh, reinforced the idea of the nuclear family and the single house. And it's very interesting how the same preciado also relates this time, this technological change, as a proto-momentum of what is happening nowadays. Because on one hand, we have the reinforcement of the nuclear family as the center uh, social structure of what we could call the home. But on the other hand, this home started to be transgressed, its limits started to be transgressed, as it started to be interconnected with those spheres that went beyond the home those are spaces that were beyond the home itself. And Paul, for instance, mentioned in this case, he uses the case of uh, um, Hugh Hefner and Playboy and the uh, image of the bed as the space that not only started to be used for sleeping, but also for working. And let me go back um, to the actual times. So we know that nowadays... Um, the house is not longer the space uh, where we host our belongings, uh, where we keep our belongings, or it's not only the space for caring, but it's actually a multi-connected, transient space that changes with the use of digital tools. In a way, our houses have become much more urban, and functions and uses are overlaying more and more. So modern design criteria, such as you know, the definition of a space per program, the idea of a bedroom for sleeping or a living room for staying, that used to define housing and the city at large are completely outdated. And despite these changes, we are still building mostly, uh, our built environment is mostly defined by this type of housing a modern, a, a type of housing that follows modern criteria, and it's just only addressed to the nuclear family. And by this, I mean a family structure defined by a couple or one or two kids, 
And however, we know that our social structures are much more diverse. In the case of Spain, for instance, uh, around just 30% of the society can be classified under this structural of family. So 70% it's left out of the scope. So the widespread typology that I'm referring is precisely this one in which the living room is a large space and then it follows by the uh, large master bedroom. Um, and those main spaces define how the family behaves, the space of family reunion and the structure of power among in, inside the family itself. So this type of arrangement not only empowers heteropatriarchal biases, but neglects wider social realities and ways of living. And we might think why this happens is not only due to real estate companies, but actually most of our uh, housing laws, and it does precisely what happens in Spain, but I'm pretty sure it's exactly the same here in Switzerland, do promote um, those spaces pushing developers and public institutions to keep on building this uh, housing type. And at the end of the day, putting much more weight on citizens that do not fit within that umbrella. So in my the office that I, uh, I'm part of, we like to think that we have been exp trying to explore uh, non-conforming domestic spaces as well as practices of care. We like to claim, and this is, allow me to be a little bit pretentious here, <laughs> that we want to dismantle modern biases, or at least we invite people to think about how we should dismantle uh, modern biases in order to produce diverse and inclusive ways of living, able to welcome any social setting. So with that goal, we obviously we are critical with norms and laws, and precisely those laws that push developers to keep on producing the same housing. But also at the same time, we spend a lot of time trying to find legal loopholes that allow us to change typologies and therefore the built environment. Um, I'm gonna start with uh, one of the first projects that we built, it was finished in 2016 in um, the neighborhood of Champlain. And it's a housing project that we tried to define non-conformity through the idea of equality or equity. And we can actually, I know that this is controversial, so we can discuss this afterwards. Basically, we wanted to use the idea of a generic room that would allow uh, to be occupied in many ways. And that's uh, basically the aim behind this uh, project. So our housing block is uh, placed in the, in the neighborhood of Echampla, and for those that you are not acquainted with the neighborhood, it's the 19th century neighborhood that is defined mostly by its homogeneity. And despite its homogeneity, there's a lot of heterogeneity embedded. Despite its order, there's a lot of disorder. And we have been always fascinated by that capacity of having both. And by the capacity that actually the neighborhood has changed a lot of use. First it was housing, then it was office building, then nowadays it's coming back to housing without changing its physiognomy dramatically. And that happens thanks to, that has happened thanks to the original uh, housing typology that if you look to it from a modern perspective, it's actually, or from our, our biased, distorted modern perspective, is actually diff very difficult to distinguish where was the bathroom, where was the bedroom, because all the rooms were similar in size, and at a low, that actually has a low that change uh, through time. So we wanted to follow that non-prescriptive character that was original, and, so, and clearly our building is just a reenactment of a past. So we designed a system of similar rooms that could be occupied in many ways. So the bedroom, the bathroom, or even the living room could be anywhere. And actually, thanks to the strategic position of the bathrooms, even the kitchen can be placed in any room. The only thing that we can move is the bathroom. Also something controversial that sometimes I'm asked, why? I have an answer. Um, and... But, and we call it 110 rooms because it is composed by precisely 110 spaces that can be potentially arranged, forming different apartment sizes. So each apartment can be sized, adding or subtracted 
rooms depending on the needs of the, the inhabitants. So with um, this building, we were not only claiming to have non-hierarchical and abstract domestic spaces, uh, but also to imagine flexi flexible domestic limits in order to define inclusive structures that could be able to change through time and adapt to social needs and life-changing needs. And I don't think that I need to enter that much into that, but just imagine the need of the need of a space that we do have in different periods of life and the consequences of that. And for the last, for the first um, five years now, it's like already seven, it hasn't changed. Uh, it has five apartments per floor, uh, sorry, four apartments per floor, each apartment equal with five rooms. Um, the patio interior patio is roofless, so it rains inside to um, improve the air quality and to reduce consumes. And um, when I mention about the capacity of uh, each apartment to grow and decrease, is actually, again, a reenactment of a past, but in this case from another context. This was uh, quite common at the end of uh, the 19th century in New York in a kitchenless typology that emerged at that time, and it exists during 60 years. Um, so more than a half out of a century, and it became a way of living in New York, and uh, ended up, this story ended up being um, uh, the Kitchenless City Project and my PhD. And actually what is interesting is the Kitchenless typology uh, is precisely that a low, the disappearance of the kitchen from the physical space of the house, but also involve a whole re reconfiguration of the city, of the urban sphere. And among other things, involve as well a redefinition of the role of women at home, and that's why it's so important nowadays. I cannot spend that much, it's a whole PhD, uh, but just to frame yourself, we are in the 19th century, after the Civil War, in 1860, 1865, okay, in the U.S., um, the only collective housing typology that exists were so-called tenements, and that was a working um, housing typology composed by just one space. No bathroom, no bedroom, no, no kitchen, no infrastructure, and in, within that space, many families used to live. So even at that time, it was considered a typology to erase. So considering this scenario, um, but also... Uh, the lack of housing stock after the civil war and the economic crisis, there was the need to build new typologies, new housing typologies in New York, a lower cost, that at the same time respond to the increase of the access to women into industrial labor and its consequences, consequential um, care crisis. And also I should say you have to also understand that slavery was being abolished at the time in the U.S. and the impact on domestic work was large. So, up here then in New York, different housing typologies that some of them engulf um, consciously or unconsciously some of the utopist, um, social utopist uh, ideas as um, Robert Owen's one or Charles Fourier, um, so the, all these uh, kitchenless uh, typologies were purely commercial but happened at the same time. Obviously, I want to quote um, Doris Hayden here because I do own her a lot. And she was the one working on material feminists, pointing out many projects that emerged in the 19th century. And I took a fragment of uh, Dolores' work and um, basically link it to a set of commercial uh, and initiatives that, and certain cities that allow the emerge of hundreds of buildings um, to emerge during a, that period of time. And when I mean hundred, I also want to expose that the variety of the dwellers. We can uh, find very small apartments without kitchen, uh, like two rooms and a bathroom without the kitchen. Um, to larger infrastructures. Here we have two apartments per floor, many rooms, all kind of luxurious um, um, spaces, 
but not kitchen. Instead, these buildings had collective kitchens and other domestic collective services. And as mentioned, at the end of the century, there started to be common in these buildings to offer a wider flexibility in the composition of apartments. And as mentioned, the San Remo, among others, had the capacity to expand and decrease the apartment size by adding or subtracting room and room. And this richness of diversity of types um, grew enormously at the verge of the 20th century, uh, when we can find typologies that even contain kitchens within the apartments, different sizes, rooms that could expand or decrease, and services that started to be extremely rich in variety. I am going to show very fast the maps because I think it's important to be aware, see what happens after 1900. We map, well, I map uh, hundreds of them. And after 1900, you have the explosion of dots. And that's because in 1901, there was a housing law, the tenement housing law, that left outside the scope of uh, the law, the kitchenless apartments. So suddenly, uh, with the same lot, the kitchenless apartment could be larger and bigger more numbers of apartments within one building. So therefore, in the same moment, at, after 1901, one could rent with the same amount of rent a kitchenless apartment or a kitchen apartment. In the kitchenless apartment would include nursery service, healthcare services, um, food, cook, raw food, everything within the same amount of rent. So you can imagine that they were extremely successful. And the decay, I'm not going to go that much into this, but there are many reasons for the decay after 1929, the economical crash. And among other stories, the uh, emerge of the idea of efficiency that I was mentioning before, that grew enormously. And among other things, engulf certain things that were already happening. For instance, the idea of a kitchenette, a compact kitchen. So the idea of a compact kitchen that now we're so used to, it, it emerged at that time, and it was always linked with a collective kitchen, never by itself. And I'm always claiming this because the collective kitchen is gone, but we uh, stayed with the compact kitchen. And later on, uh, coined as uh, the modern kitchen by uh, uh, Margaret Glichotsky, um, Margaret Trudelichotsky, which actually um, worked on comp modern compact kitchens 30 years after these kitchens were already in use in, the, in New York. Um, let me go back to the 110 rooms. So, <laughs> the clock. It's just going to run. Uh, facade, not important. Ground floor, not important. <laughs> <laughs> Garden, beautiful. Uh, if you come to Barcelona, <laughs> come in. And it's actually very nice when it rains because I just mentioned the, the, the rain comes in. It's very nice. So, well, after 110, we have, uh, we, we are very happy because um, um, it got visibility, not only our project, many things were happening in Barcelona. It's not us putting pressure, but many people putting pressure to municipality to change policies. And luckily nowadays, Barcelona municipal housing policies do in include um, gender perspectives in their call. Um, and since then, many similar um, floor plans have emerged. So if you take a look to public housing nowadays, it looks very similar. Um, and we are all pushing for the same goals, and this is very exciting. So things, yes, things can change. Now, we, in public housing, the living room is not that common anymore, or the idea of a master bedroom is not that common anymore. Um, and we have, in the office, pushed these ideas further in many projects, um, a lot of lost competitions. I will talk about that um, in a future lecture, that it will happen also in the school. Failures, a lot of failures. Projects that are on hold in Mexico, social housing on hold. Um, but let me explain uh, San Feliu, which is we are already uh, almost finishing, like this week, literally. Um, um, and it's a housing block um, in San Feliu that is closed by Barcelona, and it's a social housing project. And it's similar to Provenza, 210 rooms. 
And as you see, this, the apartments are similar. The main difference is that here, due to social housing, we could just afford 800 euros per square meter. I mean, now, like, if you want to have a ratio in Barcelona, then ratio now it's 2,000. So to build with by 800, it's hardcore. So you cannot afford, yeah, hardcore, 800. You cannot afford two bathrooms. But you can afford a space, a little bit of a space, and um, and afford the, the infrastructure to uh, allow a room, an extreme exterior room, to be cancelled as a winter garden. So in social housing, you have to be pay attention to consumed afterwards. It's the most important thing. So this house is designed not to cost afterwards. Um, and if there are very light changes. The winter garden... The, the doors are not in the center. And, and let me talk a little bit about the doors. Because the doors, we always use double doors in the process, and it's actually our loophole. Legally speaking, this double door allows us to connect, not only especially connect two spaces, but legally connect two spaces as one. So legally speaking, in our floor plans, any space can respond to any legal um, framework, the legal framework of the bedroom, the legal framework of the kitchen, the legal framework. That's why they all have the same also amount of ventilation and light. Um, so for us, it's very important also to define legal inclusivity through design and how to do that. The ground floor, the space um, literally passed through, connecting a park at the back and a street at the front. It's um, pictures of a month ago. Um, here we're missing a set of uh, huge curtains um, that are being installed this week. Very fast. Um. And the ground floor um, contains, or we want it to contain, we have been fighting. I have been saying this for a year now, and it's been stressful. We're fighting to have a public infrastructure for domestic care that would provide support to the neighbors, not only those inhabitants in the building, but actually neighbors at large. And you might ask me what means public infrastructure for domestic care. So we want, with through this infrastructure, to understand care as a part of the public realm, as a part of a city infrastructure. And this idea comes from a research that um, I have been doing these last years. Um, that is a research that uh, looks to, sorry, um, no, looks to urban kitchens, a new type of cooking space that um, does not happen within the privacy of the house, but happens in the public realm as a part of a metropolitan network. And they are used daily by thousands of citizens. We have been researching about this phenomenon that has happened, we found out, in three cities, at least, in the last 40 years. So in the last decades. And um, we have found out that they have emerged in Lima, Mexico, and um, Tokyo. Mexico City and Tokyo. Yeah. So for us, um, this type of kitchen uh, redefines... Um, how care labor is uh, in, engaged with the house and brings care labor outside the domestic sphere. And it's able to redefine the value of it, the bodies that do take care of, of care labor and the spaces that are related to it. So I'm going to explain more while in the case of Lima and more briefly the other two. Um, in the 60s, we have a scenario of large migrations from rural areas to the city of Lima. Um, and that happens because there's a lack of um, regulation and democratization of the territory. I mean territory, I mean the rural areas. And also it collides with the beginning of the guerrillas um, uh, that later on became... Uh, among others, the terrorist groups, the singing path that I'm going to talk about. You have to understand also that Lima never rains, so you have a good weather for these very fast settlements. And uh, 
in the 60s, there was a very flexible, uh, re in the city of Lima, very flexible and welcoming regulation and set of policies. Uh, Fernando Belaunde, a very important architect for Peru because he was uh, prime minister twice, he actually tried to respond to la these large migrations through modern housing, but modern housing was not built at the speed of these uh, occupations. So it was a failure. So you have to imagine that this is starting in the 60s, and by 81, 1981, more than 40% of the population was already migrant in Lima, and those numbers have picked up. What is very interesting is that all these occupations that usually happen overnight, hundreds of people would occupy it in an organized manner a land. The consequences of these uh, self-organizations were uh, very large for women. Men used to go to the city center, the lack of any transport, and therefore it took a long time to get there to look for jobs, while women stayed in their um, neighborhoods, occupied territories, and they were the ones that started to organize the first associations and committees. They are called com Comites de Lucha, most of them, Committees of Fight. So they became right away the leaders of their neighborhood. And what is interesting is to see how this initiative, this is the situation that, and we have images like this one. When I mean leaders, I mean they were taking care of everything, building sewage system, building the housing. So they were builders at, at the same time as cookers, at the same time as leaders. And we have a huge crisis in the 70s uh, due to inflation and uh, many political um, 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 not good circumstances <laughs> that push two large uh, strikes at the end of the 70s and two uh, um, stops, general stops. And this uh, invite these uh, women associations to start to organize themselves, first to cook collectively for the strikers, and later on to set themselves as officially uh, cooking infrastructures for the society that at the same time were uh, political voices. So this is important to understand because from the beginning, after this, in the 70s, we have these cookers um, stage as politicians. So they had this double role. So the kitchens became domestic parliaments, feminist spaces of resistance, places where women developed their capacity to plan and negotiate community projects with the state directly, but also with private entities. And this is still the situation nowadays. Um, and for the first time, there were also women's spaces in which heteropatriarchal um, structures were placed into question. You have to understand that women at that time had access to vote. Vote was, uh, the right to vote in Peru was in 55, very, very um, early on. They had access to um, education, but that doesn't mean a real access, especially for uh, migrant women. So for them meant something more than access to food, but it was an opportunity to have a political voice. In the 80s, we have, again, another crisis, and we have the role of uh, Violeta Correa, who's Belaunde, first, uh, who's Belaunde wife, an, act, an active, an active uh, feminist, and I guess that the fact that he, uh, as an architect, was interested in architecture, she was able to promote during uh, the second period of uh, Beleaunde's government in the 80s, the so-called cocinas familiares, family kitchens, we were, were actually just a consolidation of what was happening then. And then we have this typology largely spread in Lima, around more than 100 of them. Um, most of them are placed in open, open spaces, in canchas, um, Can explain why? Maybe ask. <laughs> uh, in, at the end of the 90s, we have eight massive manifestations. And I want to say this because in 1991, um, we have uh, the first law 
um, well, we have the law that protect these kitchens. So there's now, legally speaking, there's a law that sets that is the right to have a public kitchen in um, Peru and protect them not only legally but also economically. And then, um, what happened after the 90s? So we have, uh, as mentioned, the different uh, terrorist groups. Among others, uh, the Singing Path took Lima, and it was uh, dramatic uh, for uh, them uh, because, as mentioned, they were very important political voices. So Sendero uh, started to attack the, uh, um, the public kitchens and murder many of the leaders. Um, there, I mean, you can Google it. There are hundreds of um, pieces of newspaper that talk about that. And probably the most, the most relevant one was uh, Marilena um, uh, uh, Moyano, um, an Afro-descendant uh, feminist and activist leader of one of the kitchens that uh, which body was exploded in public. And that affect enormously the conscience of... Um, of this, the situation to the point that 300,000 people took the streets to protest against that crime. And we have this massive image in, in favor of Maria Elena Boyano. Just saying this because you have to picture the importance of, of these women. Nowadays, uh, with a group of uh, my colleagues, uh, with uh, researchers at uh, GSAP Columbia, we have been mapping them. We, um, uh, Google, uh, so you have a sense of the distance between each of them. There are more than 2,500, those that we have found. There might be many more. Just to compare numbers, in New York, New York is the same size as Lima, and in New York, we have 1,500 public schools. So there are more public kitchens in Lima than public schools in New York, just to give you a sense. Some images, uh, nowadays some of them occupy um, spaces that do are rent or owned by the leaders. There are groups of 15 women that cook every three days in groups of three. They deny any payment because they consider that that's capitalist and they claim pre a pre-colonial culture. Some of them are occupying houses, as this one. Some of them are very large, are very well equipped, designed by cool architects, as this one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And um, the same phenomenon, uh, it's interesting to see how the same phenomenon has happened as well in Mexico, but with another completely different context and completely different uh, uh, reason. After 2008, the city of Mexico decided to promote uh, public uh, kitchens as well. In this case, it's a top-down scenario. Any citizen with a space larger than 30 square meter can apply, and uh, as a as an answer, the government would install an industrial kitchen. And there, um, the, those that apply need to cook daily for around 300 people. And there, the menu is paid. And the ones that work with the, in these infrastructures are also paid. So they, there's a wage. It's interesting to see that in Mexico, most of them occupied private houses that are turned public for a few hours. Here, there's not a gender bias, as it happens in Lima, that just women can cook. Here, all kinds of gender can cook and participate. Um, there are diff different um, sizes. And this also has a background history um, that uh, brings us into the 60s in Mexico, when, um, um, no, sorry, to the 80s in Mexico, when in the 80s there was a, a, crisis, a huge social crisis and the government set up the first cooperatives of uh, consume, the Conasupers, to collectively purchase food. And I'm not going to go that much into it, but in every context that we have done research, there's always a reason behind. So things do not happen from one day to the other. These kind of massive uh, numbers of uh, consequences. Um, yeah, I don't have time, unfortunately. But maps are very similar in Mexico City. And a similar situation is, has also, this is Mexico nowadays, the comedores, and they are not growing more because uh, the government doesn't want to invest more. The uh, program has stopped, it's frozen, but they are continued. You can Google, you can go. <laughs> uh, um, 
and eat in them. And the same is happening in Tokyo for another completely reason. Um, in Tokyo, and this is a map of uh, today's Kodomo Shokudos. Kodomo Shokudos is an initiative, a bottom-up initiative that um, um, it's um, Kodomo is kit, Shokudo is cafeteria. And basically it's an initiative that promotes eating together initially to offer food for kids. Nowadays everyone can go or participate. And it's a volunteer initiative that it's linked with um, 2008 crisis, but also with 2011 earthquake. After both uh, crises, there was a sense of social loss. And many of these initiatives started to emerge to the point that today more than 500 uh, kitchens do uh, participate actively and um, cookers do part um, cooking groups do participate actively in Tokyo, occupy an existing spaces. They do have a liquid nature, so they move from one space to another and they cook also in that flexi with that flexible character. Those that you're here on March 14, I think, there's Chie Kono lecturing and she's actually the designer of one of them. So I invite you to attend, fantastic architect. Um, no time. And we put this into practice recently in Barcelona. We set up a public kitchen in the center of Barcelona, in Plaza Catalunya, to cook for hundreds of people daily and invite the different activists um, uh, to talk about the impact of food, the impact of us eating mussels, and we did that through the through the uh, artist a couple cooking sections, and how which is the impact of uh, that action on the seas, but also on concrete production. I want to stop here because uh, we could invite two of the leaders of uh, Lima, and um, and um, and it was a very um, a special moment. I. This is my little homage. Marlene passed away a few days ago. So, um, you know, the, one of these very um, strong women um, here, my little homage. And, um, and why we are interested in on all this? So basically because we invite you to think about the house and the city in a diffuse manner. And this idea of uh, um, this condition of... Uh, a new urban scale that is blurred it started actually way before in 2013 with an installation that we did in the, in the gallery Yerimonti in New York. It was an installation uh, that they asked us to design an archetypical house and instead of that we cut out rooms of um, uh, an ordinary of a book of, honor, of uh, ordinary German houses we spread them on a page we found a territory and we send this to the gallery as our floor plan of the archetype house. And with it, we built a model that would generate this ambiguity to the point that it was very difficult to distinguish if we were talking about a house or a set of buildings or a building or a city or a town. And this ambiguity was even more promoted by, it was even more... Um, Push further by the floor plan, in which you would, um, you could envision all kinds of occupation, but all kinds of formation. So we were inviting the visitors to imagine how our city could be perceived in the same manner, just as a spaces that can be occupied and rearranged depending on the, our social needs. And I'm going to finish with this project that doesn't have to do with kitchens, but it has to do with non-conforming spaces, non-conforming bodies. Years ago, we received the commission to design a non-conforming space for a dance performance titled Epica, which choreography by, was designed by Aymar Perez Gali. Aymar work, um, he has work about the impact of AIDS, in Spain, but also in Latin America, um, a, the impact of AIDS on dance communities. That uh, due to that, in particular on the 80s, the fluids were not um, well perceived, they were on the target, and even sweat, sweating, became considered a dangerous action, a dangerous fluid. 
So in dance studios, some tensions started to emerge because of the action of sweating. And Amar, Amar works always embodies criticisms in their body and obviously through sweating. So he always sweats a lot and asks us to sweat. So sweating for him is a political tool to give voice to subaltern figures, those that cannot have a voice. So he asked us to design this a space that would negate the possibility of recognizing um, gender through a body image. And that's quite a thing. Obviously, black box, you can don't recognize anything. Right? So basically, we design a non-stopic device, non-scopic device, a complete dark room um, that you see there are non, the walls are non-parallel to anything and that would be able to enhance sensorial factors by means of a mobile ceiling. So in complete darker darkness, the ceiling would move, reducing the sense of a space, changing the temperature and humidity and the pressure of a space, so therefore making us sweat. So in the performance, there were four dancers that could not be perceived as anyone, that they would deliver their energy, and you could perceive that really. Um, so they would deliver themselves in the space and time, being excita agents of excitation. In a really epic techno session, it was not only the space, the first time that we did it was sonar, so it was not only, you know, we had physical but also no, chemical things going on in the space. <laughs> it worked very well. So what happened is actually bodies would start to be aligned with other bodies that they would not be perceived, that they could not perceive, that they started to dance equally, even if not perceiving among us. It was um, through, through the dance. And Aymar always likes to say that for them, for those bodies, were a cellular revelation. So basically, when you don't even feel that you're a body, but you feel that you're cellules. Um, I don't know if we achieved that, but um, I think it was definitely a way of perceiving bodies and giving a space for voices that not necessarily do fit in Western canon heterosexual norms and therefore can be for a period of time. And with this, I'm going to load the questions to be raised. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anna. This was really a very nice, very inspiring talk. And I'm sure there are lots of questions and comments. I would have a lot of questions myself. But I don't want to take away space because the time is limited. And I actually would like to give the word to Kiane and Angelica from the Parity and Diversity Group who have been co-organizing this event. And I'm sure that they have many interesting questions and comments. So I hand over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Anna, you go in the middle. We're like, <laughs> or not. <laughs> Gonna be very aggressive. <laughs> so first of all, thank you so much for the impressive lecture as well, showing the entire range of your work. Um, and I think with that scale, I actually would like to start as a reflection. I'm, in my opinion, or like how I read your work, it's on one hand super broad, like you research, you build, you look into so many things, uh, societal aspects play a huge role. So I was wondering as, as well as some sort of representatives of the parity group, and as the parity group is pushing quite some questions as well and changed, brought some change to the school as well, I was very much interested in the aspect of radicality in your work like in terms of going really to the root question of an issue. So what impact or like what aspect does that 
uh, is that in your work, the question of radicality? How do you, what is your take on being radical as an architect, questioning the role, question how you work, and as well the framework within your work? Um. I have never considered us radicals, really. Um, um, our office is an architectural office. Um, maybe the only radical thing was actually a mistake because we set up the office claiming that we would never build anything. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we left the radicality <laughs> aside. It's a difficult question. Um, because probably we should start um, defining what is what means radicality, um, and it recalls me a little bit of, um, and we have uh, experts in the room um, about the need of manifestos that uh, we have had in previous years, or the need of radicality. Um, but I, 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 I'm not the one to answer, or if I answer that at the moment that we wanted to be radical. Um, we realize the impossibility of, of it somehow. Um, we have a, a quote. What we stick from the beginning is that we have a quote in the office that says, and actually is, it's a lettering on glass, large, at the entrance, that says, nothing will last from all of this. So probably I would say if we are radical, it's on that. So the awareness of nothing will last of all of this and to design with that aim. Um, and that doesn't mean that we have to destroy everything, but that you are part of a complex whole, that whatever we, you do will continue in its own way and probably won't last. But just to, to give you some more like context maybe on the aspect of radicality or why it came to my mind, because like, as I said before, how I read your work, you're really going to the underlying questions that we need to answer as well in terms of like how we act as architects in society and as well questions like the crisis of care, which we hear quite a lot at the moment as well in like as well in Switzerland, not only in Germany and wherever else, the housing crisis. So there are so many societal aspects we need to find answers to as architects. And in that sense, the, I find your, your practice very impressive in terms of really going deep down the layers, analyzing and then translating it into space and like bringing it back into architecture. So in that like leading or like maybe adding a second question before I maybe pass on the word to either the listeners or... Kiana, um, where do you see, now as we're here at an architecture school, where do you see the potential for the next generation to start as well, some sort of radically at the root question and then bring that up into some sort of architecture? I, I, I know it's very boring, but we spend, there's one person in the office reading laws all the time. <laughs> he loves laws and... <laughs> That's fantastic <laughs> because you have to know the law in order to navigate it. And uh, uh, laws are so biased nowadays that you really need to understand them to be able to uh, produce architecture that fulfills the law and goes beyond the law and is able to dismantle those biased constructions that are embedded within the law. And probably the most difficult thing as architects, is also to dismantle those economical constructions that are set up through legal frameworks that do define architectures. And that's probably one of the main goals, I would say, yes. But there are many, like, okay, <laughs> many more. I mean, this is a starting point. So starting like, point. Yes. I hope you know that you need someone in your office that understands law or likes law. <laughs> that's good. Can I do have a... Ask a question, maybe. Yeah. Like, thank you very much for your lecture. I think it, yeah, I have so many thoughts just by, because it's a very broad and has so many topics. And maybe I can continue with this, like what you said with the laws and the norms and how to challenge the concept of comfortness, as you said, like in a domestic space and how that by actually, um, 
be, be more inclusive in a way we also want to challenge this very normalized imagination of a domestic space and maybe I, I think what you just said actually inspired me a lot is how to um, make new options but still within the legal frame is maybe a very key issue of how we can actually do something but that is still legal but I wonder just because I see here it's also with a kind of value and standard so it's an epistemic question in the end about how we imagine a way of living and how this could be accepted or even beyond the academic kind of settings and yeah maybe it's in the end not a question but it's more a general question in terms of how do we challenge this kind of um epistemic settings that we already educated in schools and for so long time that um, that we cannot trust ourselves even sometimes um, yeah so it's more no, I think I think that the idea of inclusivity is um, is very um, smart to bring it up um, because one of the things that we have to be aware of also is the overuse of words for instance I mean care I mean, I mean I'm I'm the one occupying a chair, which name is overused. <laughs> and it means at the end, it's very dangerous because sometimes means nothing, inclusivity as well. Or also to not be able to embrace complexity and, and, and you know, things that are contradictory. Um, it's uh, Haspir Puar who actually talks about uh, the construction, how the construction of human rights, as soon as we achieve another human right, we are producing also exclusion. So the same with inclusivity. We cannot deny that as soon as we define something that is inclusive, in inclusivity, there's also exclusivity embedded. And we have to understand that things are complex. Also, it's a, you know, moving forward of uh, moving beyond or uh, of this idea of uh, problem solver as a, you know, as architects, as those agents that are able to have a voice. So obviously that's not anymore the case. And we have to embrace the fact that a lot of things that we do embrace complexity and are not, and I do have to be contradictory. There's no other way. Yeah, pero. Yeah, we promise to keep it really short. And fortunately, we have another lecture by you, Anna, very, very soon. So thank you very Thanks. much. That's going to be funny. We, so we have, yeah, yeah super. If you have the minutes, yes. Hi, uh, thank you so much for the amazing lecture. I think like, I'm just, I'm gonna try to be very quick. I think I was also like asking myself so long the question uh, because I'm reading Silvia Federici and then there's this like sentence where she's talking about counter planning from the kitchen. And so first I wanted to like, thank you for bringing this like very concrete example of how that happens. But at the same time, I was like a bit intrigued by how you actually, I mean, there is, um, yeah, I mean, I actually will just, because I had two questions, I'll just ask this one question. So I think uh, Federici is like mostly having this also contradictory uh, way of like asking the state for wage for care work, but at the same time trying to like abolish the state at the same time. And I just was like wondering because you are researching, uh, you mentioned how these women were like really attacked and I was like wanting to ask you actually just to tell us more about like maybe these different ways of dealing with the state. So like asking for wage, refusing to ask for wage. And then at the same time, what were these women jeopardizing <clears throat> because they were like so brutally attacked? So like, what do you think the jeopardy was in that sense? Uh, would like to take like two, three questions before Anna answers because Does anybody else have a question? Thank you. Thanks, uh, Anna. Um, 
at a certain moment after explaining the 110 room project, you showed a lot of floor plans of other projects in Barcelona and seemed to suggest that through questioning within the legal frame, um, floor plans or how one names rooms, etc., it opened up a new um, sort of new era or where you also, um, did I understand well that the floor plan and the discussion that came after it um, had an impact on the legal conditions. So it works in both ways and the uh, law follows architecture and then, or did, m maybe if that's the case, it'd be nice to hear a bit more about it. One last question and then Anna will have the hard job to answer these three questions in uh, a few <laughs> minutes uh, by addressing do justice to everybody, but otherwise there is time for an informal uh -huh. talk. Yeah, thanks for your beautiful lecture. Um, <clears throat> you seem to pro uh, promote the generic uh, floor plan as kind of an antidote to the functionalist apartment, and I was wondering how this relates again to the non-conforming body. Also to pick up on the notion of inclusivity and so on. Okay. No, I think the, um, Federici, uh, no, great. Thank you for the question, because one of the things that a lot has happened uh, since the 70s, uh, Federici, among other voices, uh, have been uh, republished uh, in the last decade, um, uh, brought back very strongly. But obviously, we're in another moment. I, I, it was, I attended to a very interesting session in which we presented books, and there was one presentation of a book, uh, The Feminist City, and she was all this time stating the women in the city and so on. And then it was Jack Halberstam, who you know because he has been here at the school in these previous years, and Jack suddenly asked, okay, can you define women? Because you're using all the time this term and I'm a little bit confused. So we are in that moment. And we're in a moment, you know, like 50 years after. Uh, so we're in a moment in that wages for housework was okay 50 years ago, but now we're rethinking what wage means. And actually we're living uh, the, what Donna Haraway, for instance, called the feminization of, uh, of wage. So everything is a precarious wage somehow. So probably to claim for wage is not a thing anymore, but rather we understand that we have to claim for um, other constructions that go beyond the one that was set up. And it's not about equity. It's about something else. And um, second question is that they were, uh, the Lima uh, leaders were punished for many years because they were very powerful. That's it. And they wanted to be erased. Now if you ask them, they deny any political um, agenda because they have been overused by politicians. They have been, you know, so they're like, no, we are not politicians. But then when um, a urban planning is set up, they are the ones designing with the architect and the ones design and the ones confirming that project of a street, a particular street and so on. So they are still powerful and politically active. Um, in, the, in terms of the norms, um, it's not that the legal framework has changed, but the calls have changed. So then suddenly, you know, competitions are, how a competition is written it's uh, even more important than the result of a competition somehow, especially at least in Spain. So they are so prescriptive sometimes that you really need to have a fantastic brief. So there was a lot of pressure um, in the late 2000 to put uh, you know, smart minds behind briefs and calls. So that would, would and, and, and that we would allow that to happen. And then the floor plan allowed the, so we just found the door really. The rest was there. So the idea of equal rooms and that jumps into non normality. Uh, and we can discuss this further because actually you can find um, welcoming spaces in many other ways as you know, darkness for instance is a tool to be welcoming. But in a housing we, we decided to go for this ambiguity of a space that was domestic through the, its, its scale, so it's not too large. You know, what, is, what defines a domestic space? So it was domestic through the, the space, but there was not, there was anything else defined. So 
So the only hierarchy that you can find is the uh, door of the entrance, and that defines hierarchy. And that's very difficult to solve. The rest, the idea is to start to think about a way of arranging spaces which hierarchy is open to be set up. And that's how it relates to non-normative, in a sense that it doesn't follow a modern normativity of a housing that is defined for a nuclear family. I think with this, we can go for the April, uh, but I want to thank you, everyone, <laughs> for the smart questions. And thank you. Thank you. Before everyone leaves the room, I would like to invite everyone for tomorrow's Parity Talks, of course, because this is the pre-event for tomorrow. So come to the workshops and a special thanks to the curatorial team of the Parity Group that worked so hard and much in the last few weeks and before. Thank you so much and come tomorrow.